I'll invite our, our next panel up to the stage and go ahead and introduce the moderator, who's our Dean of the College of Agriculture and Life Science, Catherine Bohr. She's the Ronald P. Lynch Dean of our college. She served uh, as professor and chair of the Cornell Department of Food Science from 2007 to 2010. She earned her BS in food science here at Cornell. And then she um, went to get an, an MS in food science from the University of Wisconsin and then moved all the way to the West Coast to do a PhD at the University of California, Davis. She joined the Cornell faculty as an assistant professor in 1994, and her research focuses on, on, on identifying biological factors that affect transmission of bacteria in food systems from the farm to the table. She served as a major advisor for 26 graduate students, and graduates from her laboratory now hold key food safety positions around the globe in government, academia, and the food industry. She received the 2000 USDA Honor Award as member of the Listeria Outbreak Working Group, the 2000 Foundation Scholar Award, and the 2006 De Laval Award for Dairy Extension Programming, both from the American Dairy Science Association and the 2002 Samuel Kate Prescott Award for Outstanding Research from the Institute of Food Technologists. Dr. Bohr is a fellow of the American Academy of Microbiology, of the International Academy of Food Science and Technology, and of the Institute of Food Technologists. Please join me in welcoming Dean Bohr. Well, thank you very much, Sarah, and good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for being here with us this morning. We are about to embark on an important discussion, and that discussion is of the role of the modern land-grant university in combating some of today's most critical global challenges in agriculture, food security, poverty alleviation, and rural development. Cornell's land-grant mission, like those of its peers throughout the land-grant system, has evolved and greatly expanded since the nearly 150 years uh, at the time that the university was founded. What began as a national investment in the provision of educational opportunities uh, later followed by extension of agricultural and home innovations to a largely rural agrarian working class in the United States has grown into a globally significant network of leading scientific and academic institutions that provide people around the planet with cutting edge science, technology, and the training needed to build better lives. Cornell alone has numerous research and outreach programs ongoing in dozens of nations and on every continent on Earth. And each year we welcome ever increasing numbers of international undergraduate and graduate students to our campus. Moreover, programs like this one, international programs, IPCALS, which as you know, is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year, leverage the resources and the depth of expertise available at our land grant institutions around the US to promote significant advance advancements in the areas of international agriculture and development, providing new opportunities and a more equitable and sustainable means of generating growth and prosperity for those with the greatest needs. Yet just as the relevance of our efforts has never been greater to our local, regional, national, and international stakeholders, many land-grant institutions face a series of emerging challenges that threaten our long-term ability to sustain and to build upon these important efforts. From stagnant or declining state and federal funds for agricultural research, to increasing global competition for the very best and the very brightest young investigators, and new concerns from parents and students about the rising costs and perceived diminishing returns of higher education today and in the years ahead, we will confront a series of fundamental questions that will determine the shape, the scope, and the impact of our land-grant enterprise, and in particular, our ongoing global reach and influence. We aim to address some of these questions during this morning's panel, and this panel features representatives from several leading land-grant institutions with very proud histories of international engagement and achievement. We will begin this morning by asking each panelist to make an opening statement explaining why he or she does or does not believe that the modern U.S. land-grant university is best positioned to address global challenges in agriculture and development. 
We'll then engage in what I anticipate will be a lively conversation about their statements. Then we'll explore a series of related questions about the promise, the limitations, and the opportunities for growth for international engagement efforts at our land-grant institutions. And finally, in our remaining time, I'll open the floor to any questions that you may have for our panelists. But now, I'd like to kick things off by introducing our first panelist, and that's Dr. Elsa Morano. Dr. Morano has a, a long and distinguished research career as a food microbiologist. She is a nationally respected leader in food safety, having been appointed by President George W. Bush as Undersecretary for Food Safety at the USDA in 2001. She is also a highly regarded academic leader, having served as Dean and Vice Chancellor of Agriculture and Life Sciences at Texas A&M University. And, and, and Dr. Morano was the first Hispanic and the first woman to serve as that university's president. Since 2012, she has served as interim director of the Norman E. Borlaug Institute for International Agriculture, which oversees a $55 million research project portfolio in Asia, Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and the Middle East. In addition to her active research and teaching duties, she also serves on several government, foundation, and corporate boards. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Elsa Morano. Well, as we say in Texas, howdy. <laughs> and I have to tell you, I admire greatly your dean for all her great accomplishments and uh, like her very much because she and I have something in common. Um, <laughs> and that works really well because uh, a lot of times I, I speak at events and the podium is too high. Um, so this is perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, for, for having me here in this, in this, at this event, and I have to congratulate you all for uh, the, the magnificent 50 years um, that, that you have spent as an institution working in international agriculture. Um, I could say a lot of things, and, and all of us were talking about it this morning, that, that perhaps uh, you know, if, we, if we stay up here too long, we're, we're gonna steal each other's ideas, and because I think we, we're all gonna end up um, um, bringing up a lot of the same points. So I'm gonna try to be as brief as I can, and, and I will answer the question of, is the land-grant university system, if you will, uh, poised well uh, to, to do this work? And, and I would say a resounding yes, but there's, there's always a caveat, and, and the caveat is simply because there's, there's some challenges that we have to meet. I will say yes, uh, because I think as all of us know who are, are in agriculture, uh, know that we have, as land-grant institutions, the ability to connect the research and, with the translation of that research uh, so that we can communicate that to the end user like no other kind of institution. Uh, there's no other kind of institution type that can do that as well as land-grant universities. Uh, secondly, because we have access to the next generation of leaders, um, you know, the, the chemonics of this world and, and some of these other um, entities that work in international agricultural development, they're great organizations, but they don't have access to the youth of, of this country and other countries for that matter, uh, like we do. And then thirdly, we have a track record um, on how to work well with colleagues, um, and with other kinds of organizations. We do it all the time. It's, it's what we've had to do, uh, especially the public land-grant universities have had to, to learn how to work well with others because of the diminishing funds that are available. But I say no or a but in terms of uh, our being well positioned to, to work in international agricultural development because we have Three challenges in my mind, we have lots, but three that come to mind right away for me, um, and one that is, I think, uppermost in, in all of our concerns is, is that we tend to be uh, the dog that follows the wagging tail, uh, if you will. Um, we are always uh, responding to uh, funding donors, if you will, um, that have the, the funds to, to, for us to carry out work in international agriculture development. And we are very seldom at the table in defining 
the direction of where those funds should go. You know, sure, we we write proposals and so forth, and they have objectives and 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 so forth. But but just the big picture, uh, we're not often sitting at the table um, with those folks. Secondly, I would say within that um, idea of that we're not necessarily the drivers that we need to be, is that. Uh, there are other universities, Harvard University, Columbia University, some other universities that are not agriculture universities, um, but they sit at the table with with uh, with decision makers, high level decision makers, and uh, they want to be relevant in that in in agricultural development, but they lack certainly the expertise that we have. So how do we connect better with them so that we can be true partners in that endeavor? Um, the second challenge I would say is, is I think one that we all appreciate is, is how do we convince the U.S. Congress, let alone the public at large, uh, to see the necessity for us to be engaged in international agriculture development um, in, in many parts of the world. And um, the third thing would be uh, perhaps something maybe a little bit simpler uh, of a challenge is how do we plan for a succession of our international agriculture uh, programs, institutes, whatever we call ourselves, who's going to be the next Ronnie Kaufman uh, here at Cornell? And uh, these are the kind of some thoughts that I would uh, propose for us to ponder as we uh, discuss all of this this morning. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Morano. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Mark Erbaugh, Director of International Programs in Agriculture at The Ohio State University. <laughs> For over 25 years, Dr. Erbaugh has built an impressive career in administering and implementing international development and capacity building programs for agricultural research, extension, and natural resource management. He has designed, administered, and implemented overseas development contracts funded by the World Bank, USAID, and the USDA in 14 different countries and has led various field training research and extension efforts in the Caribbean, Sub-Saharan Africa, India, and China. Since 2010, he has served as Director of the International Programs and Agriculture Office in the College of Food, Agricultural, and Environmental Sciences at OSU. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mark Erbaugh. I just want to let everybody know that uh, since our, our former president, Dr. Gordon Gee, has been relieved of his duties, that the emphasis on the Ohio State University has, uh, has, has gone down. So we, we are just back to Ohio State University. I'm sure you're all relieved, but uh, good, mor <laughs> good morning to all of you, and I, I, I want to uh, thank uh, Cornell University for uh, hosting and organizing this conference and providing all of us kind of a, a much needed opportunity to reflect and discuss uh, on this important topic of how do we move this international engagement agenda forward. Of course, we were asked to respond to the question of, uh, you know, are we positioned uh, to address global agricultural challenges? And I want to respond to this question by focusing on our capacity to address the challenge of partnering with other countries to help them build sustainable institutions of higher education through human and institutional capacity development. This perspective, I believe, is consistent with uh, comments made by Rajiv Shah, the administrator of USAID, uh, on the need to focus on sustainable development. And sustainable development requires creating strong institutions of higher education to address development challenges through technology generation and innovation and to train the next generation of scientists, educators, and leaders. Like many land-grant universities, uh, the College of Food, Agriculture, and Environmental Sciences at Ohio State has a long history of institutional capacity building it goes back to 1955 when we were contracted to assist three states in India to build land-grant universities. These were in the states of Punjab, Haryana, and Rajasthan. 
And these were to be land grant institutions complete with the, the, the tripartite mission of, of teaching, research, and outreach. Six other land grant universities were engaged in other states a, a, at this same time. Our, this initial commitment to work in India lasted 18 years and only was ended because there were some geopolitical differences that emerged between the United States and India. The size of this program was, was very impressive when I go into the data. I heard Larry Zeidema put together the, the, the history here. Well, uh, we all need to do this because if we don't remember some of this stuff, then it quickly gets forgotten. Um, we had 160 Indian scientists who received advanced degree training at Ohio State University. And most amazing to me is that we had 98 of our own faculty do long and short term assignments in India. We continue to collaborate uh, particularly with Punjab Agricultural University to this day. Our next long term engagement occurred in Brazil. It began in 1964. Uh, it, it was with the University, University of Sao Paulo and their uh, College of Agriculture at Piracicaba. And again, we had uh, 36 of our faculty who, who went down there and participated in this program. We had 100 Brazilian faculty receive advanced degrees at Ohio State University. And this partnership continues to this day. Several lessons to be learned from some of these uh, earlier days of, of, of uh, capacity building uh, 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 projects were that long-term partnerships build capacity and commitments on the part of uh, uh, both uh, sides who are participating. But these uh, participations take a long time to evolve because they, are, they need to build trust. And to build trust between partners, that takes time. They require uh, national and institutional commitments on both sides. And they need to be partner-led, which requires working closely with administrative counterparts, it, it, with our institutional counterparts. From 1983 to 93, we're engaged in uh, a USAID-funded project in Uganda, working with uh, Macquarie University Faculty of Agriculture and then Forestry and the National Agriculture Research Organization. This project was focused on rehabilitating the agriculture experiment stations, uh, retraining agricultural scientists, and improving the overall management and direction of agriculture research there. It was a 10-year project and was followed by a World Bank funded project that we actually uh, worked with Cornell on implementing, Agriculture Research and Training Project. And that lasted another five years. At the end of that project, we had trained perhaps between the two projects between 50 and 60 uh, Ugandan agricultural scientists. I was at a reception uh, in Uganda in, in the mid to late 90s when the ART P project was, was rounding up. And I was talking to the, the dean of the Faculty of Agriculture and Forestry. And I was all, the DG of the National Agriculture Research Organization were there. And we had kind of, we had talked to some people from USAID who said that they were, you know, kind of getting out of the business of, of doing uh, human capacity building and training. And I was talking to the, the DG and the dean. And they said the most important part of the projects that we had been engaged with was the human capacity development or uh, building. And that was through the long-term degree training. They said the technical assistance was fine, but it was that degree training that was the most important part of the projects because degrees can never be taken away. And it's the gift that keeps on giving to an institution building uh, strong institutions. We're currently engaged in a new institutional capacity building project with uh, Sokowene University of Agriculture in Tanzania. And this project includes long-term degree training, it includes collaborative research, and it has a uh, new aspect that focuses on, uh, on enhancing SUA's capacity, uh, institutional capacity, through uh, in working with SUA to use ICTs, to build public-private partnerships, and also now one, uh, a component that's working on organizational leadership and change management. What we walked into with Sokoweni University is an institution that was unable or unwilling or scared to adapt to a rapidly changing environment over there. Uh, the 
student enrollment had doubled, the, the uh, uh, faculty, uh, trained faculty had, uh, you know, were, were nearing retirement. Um, the country as a whole, the population set to double by 2050, and urban population will surpass rural population in the same time period. And they were unable to move forward on this change agenda. So we're working with the, the, the administrators and, and faculty over there uh, to build this orientation, to make them more agile, and more, make them more accepting of, 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 uh, of change. In conclusion on my comments here, I believe that the U.S. land-grant universities working through partnerships with counterpart institutions uh, in other nations have the capacity, the experience, and the comparative advantage to continue making important contributions to institutional capacity development. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Erbaugh. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Alton Johnson, Dean and Professor of Soil Physics, College of Agriculture and Human Sciences, and Director of University Land Grant Programs at Prairie View a and University. Dr. Johnson has had a notable career in scientific research and academic administration, having served in numerous leadership roles, both at Prairie View a and where he joined the faculty in 2011, and during his previous 16-year career at Elkhorn State University. A native of Monrovia, Liberia, Dr. Johnson holds a bachelor's degree in general agriculture from the University of Liberia, a master's in agronomy with a concentration in soil and water management and conservation from Mississippi State University, and a PhD in agronomy with a concentration in soil physics from the University of Arkansas Fayetteville. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Johnson. Good morning. I like to time myself because sometimes I get carried away. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, that was appreciated. I indicated that he's going to put a lifesaver in his mouth, and when it's over, then of course he's going to stop. He forgot he put a button in his mouth. <laughs> and he kept on going, so we, we're going to stop that. Um, What I want to do this morning is uh, to talk about, to, to take a different, a little bit different approach. And to answer this question, I will begin to assess the land grant idea. Why was it created? How has it evolved over the decades? And then join me in the next minute and to actually address the evolution of the land grant system and then we can get into engagement in an international community. Let me offer an excerpt uh, that was provided years ago in the Morrell Act. And it said, to create a college where the leading object shall be without excluding other classical and scientific studies and including military tactics, on and on and on. But there was a young man called Alfred Atkins. I think he was the fourth president of Montana State University, and later on, of course, uh, University of Arizona. And he gave a speech at the 75th anniversary of the Morrell Act. That was in 37, 1937. He indicated that the future of land-grant colleges will be determined by the nature of the problems which come up in the areas they serve, in other words, in the state. And that was very important. So what have we done? We've gone through series of events. And then, of course, I think it was 2010, some of you, 2009, 2010, some of you were involved in this, in trying to carve out the destiny of the National Institute of Food and Agriculture in terms of its goals. 
as dean of the land grant college, we had to do projects. We have to do, in fact, we get most of our money from formula funding. So we have to <coughs> do the plan of work. And so there were five NIFA goals. Well, the goals are keeping American agriculture competitive while any world hunger, improve nutrition and end childhood obesity, improve food security for all Americans, secure America's energy future through renewable biofuels, and mitigate and adapt agriculture to variation of climates. Those were the five NIFA goals. Of course, Roger Beachy pushed that. We moved from CSRES with, uh, for a very long time, and Rav Shah came in, and we went to NIFA, uh, Roger Beachy, and so forth. Uh, and then Sonny Ramaswamy came on. And he sent us a letter and said, hey, you know, do not provide us information exclusively to the NIFA goals. Let it link with what you do in your states. Is it familiar? That's what Atkins was talking about 75 years ago, isn't it? Now, why did I bring this out? The question that we tend to ask most of the time is, how many foreign-born citizens or how many foreign-born scientists, that's engineers, applied, basic or social scientists, have graduated from our land-grant universities over the past 150 years? How has this education from our land-grant system influenced the way we do things globally? To answer this question and to answer the question of the day, strategic agility has occurred over the years in the land grant system. We've evolved. And so, yes, we are positioned. But just as Elsa said, there are other challenges. Because what I know is that land grant university must emphasize the existence of those students who I mean, uh, 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 enroll in these universities. For example, <clears throat> students at Cornell University, when you ask them whether Cornell, you know, if it were not, if, let, let's just assume even students in the College of Agriculture here, if you call it a College of Agriculture, is Cornell University a land grant university? Well, some of them will tell you what is land grant. They don't know. Okay? <clears throat> we are, not telling the story, emphasizing why we were established. And most of you here in the crowd, I think, know Mike, Michael Martin. He talked about the land grant university, and he talked about, he argued vehemently on the land grant university effort and how to keep it and keep this model. So, what do we do to engage the global community? Well, at Prairie View AM University, what we've done. Since I became dean, Elsa, we made sure that we have a core course in the general education program, a, a course catalog that we call land grant system and food security. So any student that comes to Prairie View, there are about 8,250 students at Prairie View a and University, they have to take that to know what that is all about, even if they were history majors, so they would know what it's all about. They need to know the Homestead Act and so forth. They have to have a clear understanding in terms of global engagement. And that's very important. I think we are well positioned to do this. But what is happening is that we in the land grant community are not re-emphasizing our existence. And that's very important. I think if we recognize that, we will see what happens because I know the next session will be funding because what happened in that light is that you have people who are lawmakers and, of course, their um, the 20 year olds are always with them in Congress. You know, they help them in carving policies and so forth. 
and some of them are on agriculture, the agriculture committee and so forth. We have to all of the time try to educate them. But what if a people like that who were history majors took a land grant system and food security course at their land grant university that they graduated from? Because they had to be re-educated all the time, or educated about land grant system. And of course, and I will end with this, to start talking about how best we can position ourselves because we have a lasting partnership with the National Institute of Food and Agriculture or with the USDA. Because you see, what's happening on the continent of Africa, where I come from, there is a country in Europe that is campaigning against GMO in Africa that comes from the United States, but they are on the other side still promoting GMO in Africa. And I was talking with a deputy secretary one time, and I told him, I said, hey, you know what? What we need to do is that the school, school like my school, school like Tuskegee and other 1890 institutions have most foreign-born faculty. We should be the one to engage in these African presidents and African governments to promote America's GMO. Because we know France is doing that. And so that's important. So the whole thing here is yes, but strategic agility as we have evolved over the years is very important in trying to engage the international community. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. And next, I'd like to welcome Dr. James Lowenberg de Boer, Associate Dean and Director of International Programs in Agriculture at Purdue University. For more than 30 years, Dr. Lowenberg de Boer has worked in 52 countries around the world, conducting agricultural research, teaching, and outreach, and providing leadership expertise. His research program focuses on the economics of agricultural technology, and he is principal investigator for the Purdue Improved Cowpea Storage Project, which is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I'm also pleased to mention, got to get in a little, little uh, advertising here, that Dr. Lowenberg de Boer is a CALS alum, alumnus, having earned his MS in agricultural economics here in 1982. So I'm really pleased about that. Please join me in welcoming back Dr. James Lowenberg de Boer. Thank you, Dean Bohr, uh, and it's a great pleasure to be back here on campus. Unfortunately, it's been uh, a bit longer than I would have, would have liked. Um, the, the question that's posed to us, is the land-grant university system uh, poised to, to play a continuing role in uh, agricultural development, in food security, in rural development, uh, is one that's very close to our hearts uh, at Purdue. Uh, in the College of Agriculture, uh, we see international uh, activities, development activities, other capacity building as part of our core competency, our DNA, if you will, and just a few facts. We could echo many of the same stories that uh, Dr. Orbao uh, told about uh, the, the history of this development, but uh, we have about 60 years of uh, engagement uh, in international activities in the college. Currently, we're involved in about 60 countries uh, with a focus in sub-Saharan Africa, particularly Francophone Africa, uh, and in Central Asia, particularly Afghanistan. And uh, I think one key point uh, which influences faculty interest is all of our ag faculty are expected to be engaged internationally. This is part of our P&T process. Uh, and so the major role of the unit that I lead is to work with those faculty to find useful, uh, important ways of, of working out that, uh, that engagement. So I would say, uh, echoing some of the previous speakers, that yes, land-grant universities, and Purdue in particular, uh, is poised to play an important role, uh, but I think we need to think about which role that is. It isn't maybe necessarily the same roles as in the past, 
Uh, it, uh, we need to pick uh, our uh, strategy and our goals uh, very carefully, given uh, our particular constraints uh, and um, opportunities and strengths. And we have to recognize that uh, basically universities, and this is true of land grants and others as well, are medieval institutions somehow transported into the modern world. And we've brought many of those practices uh, along with us, and they've been very successful uh, over time, but they pose particular uh, uh, challenges as we face the modern world. One of them was mentioned by uh, the first speaker this morning that in the past, much of our international activity was in faculty to faculty, individual research uh, investigator type of, of projects. Well, when you get into large scale multidisciplinary projects, uh, there needs to be a much greater uh, leadership involvement from uh, the college and the university level. How do we match that bottom up faculty initiative uh, culture with a need for greater coordination than we had uh, in, in the past. So in working out our approach to uh, this, to the future of international programs uh, at our land grant university at Purdue, uh, there's four problems which uh, preoccupy us and which uh, I would like to, to mention uh, to you. And one of them is the issue that's been raised before of the declining uh, resources from uh, the federal government, and I would say from all governments. It's not just the, the government in Washington, but it's the European governments, it's other uh, industrialized governments around the world. Less money from them for the kinds of things uh, that we do, and the money that is available is focused on certain places. And I would argue that in the future, much of the money for the things that Purdue has done well in the past in international agriculture, which is capacity building and technology development research aimed at solving basic problems, will go to conflict and post-conflict countries. It will go to the Iraqs, the Afghanistans uh, of the world, and unfortunately, there probably won't be a lack of those kinds of countries around. That I wish, I wish it would stop, but it probably won't. Uh, and the question for us at Purdue, how much of our portfolio do we want in that kind of activity? Um, I would argue that it's a good thing for us to do, and our dean and provost and president would echo that, that we need to be there, but the question is, how much of that do we want to do? We've been deeply involved in Afghanistan. I'm very familiar with the kinds of questions. How much effort do we want to put into dealing with those specific problems? Learning how to deal with security. So for instance, at Purdue, we don't use armed security anywhere in the world. We've decided that just attracts unwelcome attention. But other universities have made different, different choices. And and I'm not saying one choice is, is the right one, but it's a choice that has to be made and not one that you can just leave to, to chance. And so one needs to, to, to think about that and think about what, what should be uh, the portion of uh, those conflict and post-conflict country activities in your portfolio. Um, secondly, um, we spend a lot of time thinking about how we will engage with uh, the newly industrialized countries of the world, many of which have very large agricultural education and research budgets. So uh, China has the largest agricultural research uh, budget uh, in, in the world. Brazil has a very successful one, uh, very important uh, institutions and activities there. How do we engage with those countries? We're a little bit on the other end of the spectrum from MIT. At Purdue, we have engaged with the very poorest countries. We understand that business model. We, we know those donors, the USAIDs, the Gates Foundations, the other donors that interact there. We know how to do that. Uh, we have been somewhat involved, much less, on the upper end of the scale. But what we're worried about is that middle. How do we engage with 
uh, the Chinese, the Brazilians, the Malaysians, the, the Turks, uh, who have very important agricultural uh, research and education and capacity building issues, uh, but are on a different place. Uh, they're not attracting that donor money. Uh, some of them have some of their own money that they're willing to put in. Uh, the Chinese case is maybe the easiest one. They're willing to put a lot of money uh, into uh, attracting us as partners, but they won't pay for everything. And how do you pay for those things that that uh, newly middle income uh, partner uh, can't or or won't uh, won't pay for? A third issue that I'd like to raise is that, in part, as a sign of our success, that uh, many of the uh, technologies uh, and innovations that we're talking about will increasingly be commercial. We will be engaged in developing countries with agribusiness, with commercial agriculture, of whatever size and scale, and that varies a lot from country to country. But we need to think about how we're going to do that. And uh, the Purdue Improved Crop Storage Project has been a great learning experience for us because it has been very commercially successful. We have sold uh, right now uh, 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 over three million of these crop storage bags and almost all of them have been sold. Uh, we've given a few away as demonstrations but we have shown that farmers in Africa are very willing to buy this product because the profit potential is very high for them. They can store three or four months and make 100%, uh, 200%, 300% uh, of profits. But how do we steward that technology? When do we hand it over? And how do we hand it over? And who do we hand it over to? Uh, we have worked on picks with mostly with uh, local uh, entrepreneurs. We recently licensed uh, the technology for Western Central Africa to a company called Lelo Agro in Kano, Nigeria. Um, and uh, there was lots of criticism from all directions on that. You know, should we be licensing? Shouldn't this be a public good that's just handed out there? But if it's a public good, uh, who's going to be concerned about the quality of this product and making sure that it's manufactured to the specifications required for uh, safe storage uh, of, of the grain uh, involved? Do we charge a licensing fee or a royalty that would allow us to continue to be involved uh, to solve technical problems. So there's a whole set of, of issues there on technology stewardship in a commercial setting that at least we at Purdue haven't dealt with before. I know for sure that license to Leila Agro in Kano was the first time that Purdue Research Foundation has licensed the technology in Africa. Uh, and uh, we need to think uh, about those issues. A fourth uh, question uh, that, that we need to think about is the tendency of donors to come to us with one-size-fits-all solutions. That they have an experience someplace in the world where something worked and they want us to do the same thing elsewhere. And this might be in project management. So in Africa, increasingly, we work through partners. We don't station our own uh, staff uh, in uh, in most African countries. We have this long uh, history of uh, uh, alumni and other people we've worked with over the years. Uh, it's, we find it's, number one, cheaper and much more effective uh, to directly involve those, uh, those partners from the beginning. Uh, at least one particular donor has come to us recently saying, well, we need to have people in, uh, in place in Africa. This occurs with uh, women's programs. Uh, women's aspirations in different parts of the world are different. The way their cultures uh, involve them and allocate to them uh, resources are different. Uh, and so we try to take that into account. That isn't always the case uh, of our donors. And I guess overall, I would argue for a um, one of the biggest issues is being judged on our outcomes, not on our inputs. So uh, donors often come to us wanting certain kinds of, 
uh, development approaches, wanting certain amount of leverage and matching. Uh, all of these are input side parameters. Uh, wanting uh, partners of certain kinds and types. Uh, and uh, not every project is the same, obviously. Not every country, not every technology. Uh, and it would be uh, much, much better, I think, if we could be judged on our, uh, on our outcomes uh, instead of uh, on those input side parameters. So overall, I think there's a bright future for the land grants in international engagement for those who choose uh, to be uh, engaged, but we need to choose uh, our battles uh, very carefully and identify those in which we can make a real difference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Lewenberg DeBoer. And our final panelist this morning is Dr. Ronnie Kaufman, International Professor of Plant Breeding and Genetics and Director of Cal's International Programs here at Cornell University. Dr. Kaufman is widely recognized for his numerous career contributions spanning over 40 years in the US and abroad, working to ensure global food security through agricultural innovation and education. He serves as principal investigator of the Agricultural Biotechnology Support Project and the Agricultural Innovation Partnership, as well as the Durable Rust Resistance in Wheat Project and the Next Generation Cassava Project, both of which, the latter two of which, are funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the UK Department for International Development. Ronnie also serves as vice chair of the Borlaug Global Rust Initiative and sits on the boards of trustees for the American University of Beirut and the International Service for the Acquisition of Agrobiotech Applications, as well as on the Council of Advisors of the World Food Prize. And just a few weeks ago, Dr. Kaufman was distinguished with the honor of being named the inaugural World Agricultural Prize winner by the Global Confederation of Higher Education Associations for Agriculture and Life Sciences. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ronnie Kaufman. Thank you, Catherine. This, this sort, I used to hide behind these podiums, but. <laughs> <laughs> now, now I feel exposed, but uh, thank you, Catherine. Catherine is the, is the fourth dean I've worked for, and uh, I love working for her, so I hope she lasts as long as I do. <laughs> and uh, I want to thank her and, and, and her colleague, Max Pfeffer, for all their support for this 50th anniversary effort. Uh, it, it's, it's, uh, we've had, I think, uh, nine events, and I want to especially thank our senior associate director, uh, Sarah Evanega, for her leadership uh, in, in this effort. It's, uh, it's been a long, uh, well, it's been a good year, Sarah, a long year and a good year, a lot of good events. So thank you so much. And I, I want to also thank all my uh, colleagues, especially my colleagues from the board of the American University of Beirut, Philip Khoury, who did the wonderful presentation to lead us off. And, Jose Zagul, who's going to start us off in the afternoon, and, and my counterparts from, from the other land grants and, and others who are contributing to the program today. Thank you all so much for, for coming. Many of you know that Cornell's first technical uh, program was with China back in the 1920s. I always mention it because plant breeders were involved. And then when I see an economist in the audience like Bob Hurd over there, I mentioned there was an economist involved too. His name was Losing Buck, and he married Pearl Buck, and she wrote The Good Earth while all that was going on, which might be the most significant uh, outcome of the whole endeavor. So uh, there are a lot of women in the audience, so I thought I should mention that. So this, this project, though, was actually a model uh, for, for Cornell's uh, plant breeding department uh, over the years. I think it, it, it had the effect of internationalizing uh, uh, that department and, 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 and others asso associated with it. And, and uh, today, I, you know, I brag a little bit that, that it's one of the leading uh, plant breeding departments in the world, top of the NRC rankings, along with the Dean's Department of uh, Food Science. Those two departments were, uh, had that uh, dis distinguished ranking this past year. But to answer the Dean's question today, are we best positioned to address the challenges of global agriculture. I think, if, if I think about my own field uh, of uh, plant breeding, the, the answer is, 
is yes and no. Uh, it's yes in terms of, for instance, conceptualizing technology and providing leadership in leading edge technology such as genomic selection, which is what we're about in our field now, harnessing the power of computers for, for crop improvement, and that's only going to speed up as time moves along. But, it, but you know, I think it's no if, if, if we look at, at our capacity, our inherent capacity here to implement those technologies. We can't really do it by ourselves. We need partners. And uh, I, I, I think that's a, a big take home message is the increased need for partnering as we look at the future. And, and, I, and I would say we're not positioned well if we look at our record of communicating the benefit of these technologies to society. That's where I think we are perhaps really falling short. For our research to be relevant in the future, we need partnerships, as I said, lasting partnerships. And forging those partnerships has been a major thrust of what uh, we've done in our office over the past few years. And maybe later on, as the dean asks a series of questions, there'll be a chance for me to brag about some of them. But uh, I think we've done a good job of starting on that. And a few weeks, uh, coming to communication, a, a few weeks ago, uh, we, we held the World Food Press celebration in Des Moines. The dean mentioned that I'm on the Council of Advisors, and I was put there by Dr. Borlaug, who, who was my mentor. Uh, he asked me to serve on it, and, and uh, I'm doing, doing, doing my best. I could, couldn't say no. This year, the prize was awarded to three biotechnologists. A lot of people uh, really didn't care for that uh, decision. Uh, but of course, I know that Dr. Borlaug would have been pleased. And uh, uh, like many of you sitting here, I'm also a firm proponent of these technologies. And I believe that it's vitally important uh, to fund public sector institutions like ours so that we can make new technologies accessible to the developing world and put nutritionally superior seed uh, that are well adapted to climate change into the hands of farmers with limited resources. Now, a lot of people are concerned about the industrialization of agriculture. And as we think about the needs of the many small scale farmers of the world, this is, this may be a, a valid concern. Too often, however, I think people confuse uh, technology, especially biotechnology, with industrialization. And as a result, we have a pretty strong, a very strong anti-biotechnology movement uh, in the world today, led by Greenpeace. So because of Greenpeace's success in communicating, and because of our failure in communicating, technology is bypassing the poor to some considerable extent. It takes so much money to overcome the resistance of Greenpeace and the unreasonable regulatory climate that they've helped to create, so much money that only the very large companies can deal with it. So technology should not bypass the poor, and we should not allow it. And I think this should be a priority for our institutions. So Dr. Jack Bobo is here from the State Department. He'll speak to you later today. He gave a wonderful seminar yesterday, really great, and pointed out something that we need to learn. And that is, when a person holds a different opinion about biotechnology, for instance, it doesn't help much to confront that person with the facts, <laughs> which is what we tend to do. I mean, we're scientists. These are the facts. You look at that. You don't get it. You're a problem, you know? I mean, but what we, we, what we really need to do is we need to identify with those people and uh, connect with them and convince them that we have the same objective of producing healthy food with a reduced footprint on the environment. We're all after the, the same thing, after all. And if, if, if we can get them on our side, uh, uh, you know, I, I think we can, we can make progress. So over the years, we, that is our land grants institutions, have succeeded in producing more with less in, in, in a very exemplary way. 
Uh, for instance, uh, Dr. Bobo had a slide, maybe you'll use it today, showing that every input needed to produce a bushel of corn has been dramatically reduced over the years. That is, it takes less energy, it takes less water, it takes less everything. By an incredible amount, it's just much cheaper to produce a bushel of corn now than it was a uh, hundred years ago based on the technology that our system uh, has brought forward. Economists call this, I see my colleague over there, Bob Hurd, he taught me the, the name of this, it's called total factor productivity. It, you have to look at, at everything and that's what we need to do. So if we're gonna be more relevant in the future, we need to connect with people, show them how we'll contribute to the improvements of their lives. When I was a kid, uh, we looked at the grand, land grants it was self-evident how, how these institutions improved our lives. Now it requires a lot of communication skills that are really constantly evolving. So I think we need to acknowledge that and make the appropriate investments. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Ronnie. That was. Um, very insightful, I think. So now the strategy that we're going to take is a little more than 15 minutes of some questions that, that we've shown our panelists and they've had a chance to think about. Um, and, and we'll give each one of them an opportunity to uh, address these questions. And then we'll open up the, the floor, uh, to the floor, that is, for any questions that you may have. And so I'd like to start, start us off. And, and actually, I'm, I'm going to ask the panel to go from uh, your left to right and then back from right to left as we uh, work on these, these questions so that we have a, a plan here. And so I'd like to start with the first one. So we've started our conversation here this morning, I think at a very appropriate high level, I think with regard to the issues that, that we are thinking about with regard to the role of our universities uh, as we look at agricultural issues and, and development. But now I'd like the panelists to look a little more uh, closely at their own institutions, and I'd like to hear them talk to us this morning about some of the greatest limitations that each of our panelists faces at their institution in terms of moving toward addressing global challenges. So if we could start with Dr. Morano. Certainly, well, um, where to begin? Because um, I think we all recognize that there are challenges in working within any organization, and um, the the challenges that I think we face at Texas A&M University are probably similar to to ones that you see across the board, which is this incredible pressure uh, for funds that um, the administrators at our university certainly feel that uh, you know shrinking funding from the state where somebody was saying before that we, we were uh, state-supported institutions, then I heard someone say once that we're state-molested institutions. <laughs> um, I'm not sure that I like that term, but anyway, um, the point being, everything's shrinking, and, and then, of course, tuition um, is being uh, held as low as possible, uh, a lot of uh, political pressure there. So bottom line here is that that pressure that our administrators and feel trickles down, if you will, to the rest of us, to, to the uh, directors of institutes like myself, uh, department heads, faculty, et cetera. Uh, and it trickles down in the sense that um, more indirect costs, for example, from, from, from projects gets sent centrally instead of uh, being distributed to, to the uh, faculty, which is where it really needs to be to prime the pump, the creative pump that that keeps us all going. Um, so that is the number one challenge I would I would say to you, uh, bar none. And then the second one um, that we face at Texas A&M University um, is is just the um, continually needing to, to convince folks, uh, whether it's uh, members of Congress from our delegation in Texas or uh, members of the industry in Texas, why we should be engaged internationally. Um, very important to, to talk about that, and there's lots of ways to explain that. One of my favorite ways to explain it is 
uh, and, and Jess talked about conflict. There's lots of places around the world where there's conflict. And uh, when there's conflict, usually it is the United States that sends our men and women to, to resolve those conflicts, those armed conflicts. And so one excellent way to prevent conflict, and to quote Dr. Borlaug, the good Dr. Borlaug, whose, whose name we, uh, he allowed us to use in our institute uh, to carry forth his legacy, along with all of our partners, including Cornell, Ohio State, et cetera, is um, peace cannot be built on empty stomachs. He said it that simply, and it's very true. So I, I like to tell people always that if you want to prevent conflict, feed the hungry, help uh, people feed themselves, uh, engage them in the development of value chains in agricultural production, processing, and marketing uh, so that you can help people help themselves. And that message, uh, we all have to engage in, in, in telling it. And I, and I think uh, you know, that message also has to be told even to our administrators, uh, not in the College of Agriculture because they get it, just like the dean here gets it, but beyond that. They don't necessarily get it. Um, so I would stop there. Well, Dean Bohr, you're asking us to be introspective, and that's always dangerous and difficult. But uh, you know, I would just uh, kind of reiterate, I think during the decade of the 90s, the, the, the whole notion of uh, capacity development uh, was left underfunded, and certainly agricultural issues during that same period were, were you know, the, the, the funding support for that uh, disappeared. As a result, the institutional memories within a lot of the donor organizations and within our own universities, it also disappeared on why we did these things, why they were important, uh, important and our commitment uh, to doing the, this type of work uh, left. So one of the challenges that we're faced with uh, at, at Ohio State is, is convincing the upper level administrators. Like you say, people in the College of Agriculture generally get it. Uh, although I, I would say that I also have to spend an increasing amount of my time now working with department heads and working with uh, our faculty to get them engaged in international activities. Resources always are important. Uh, I think it was uh, Tina Turner who had a, the old song is, what's love got to do with it? If we don't have resources, then by gosh, you know, this, this linkage, uh, the, the, you know, partnerships can only go so far. We have to have the resources. But to get my faculty now and get department chairs on board, I have to spend, a, I have to be, uh, you know, I have to have that elevator speech down to a fine uh, line, and I have to be able to uh, go out there and convince them that this is going to be good for their career. Mm -hmm. And just and one of the things that you know sometimes I'm questioned on is you know can you do good quality research overseas in developing countries, and that that's one where you know uh, I'm with some of our younger faculty in particular and department chairs. Uh, that I'm having to address. Well, <clears throat> I agree with the two speakers. Uh, you know, finance, finance, finance. Uh, resources, that is, you know, they, they, they're dwindling. And how do we keep on doing what we've done over the years? Uh, by the way, um, I'm a product of the USAID strategy to creating young individuals because I came on a USAID scholarship to the United States. But why did I stay here? I know some people are wondering. Because people in those countries, like mine, were all involved in conflict. So you had a diaspora. Now, what Elsa is saying is right. The country Liberia was plunged into war for 14 years, uh, where brothers and sisters were on both sides fighting, killing each other. Now, how do we tell that story to the lawmakers and tell them that if we start now and be proactive, 
then, of course, we will realize that this United States will be, will continue to be the greatest nation, because the nation that feeds itself, you know, doesn't have to worry about a lot of things. I think that it is not, and I always say this to people, it is not the military power of this country that makes it great. It is this country got it in 1862. They passed what we call the Morel. And then, of course, everything was just almost piece of cake, and we've evolved over the years. So training our lawmakers or helping them and guiding them to understand what we see at a horizon in the non-agriculturally related colleges and those people who are leading us in those areas. Now, by the way, Prairie View a and University just established a Confucius Institute. Uh, in fact, we just got that last month. And so that's great, and we'll continue to. But the next thing is, what about the African Institute? What about the Indian Institute, and so forth? So we need to start doing those kinds of things. At the same time, we'll be coupled with convincing the lawmakers. There's a lot of things to talk about in terms of, of the, the limitations and the constraints, and I'll uh, mentioned two of those or two areas that particularly preoccupy us at Purdue. One of them is rigidities in the way that the university does business. Uh, Purdue business office system was created to do business in Indiana, not in Afghanistan or in Nigeria or uh, the other places that, that, that we work. And the dean and I ha sort of have a, an ongoing game. You know, what's the rigidity of the day that we discover <laughs> something new every day that we, you know, we thought was obvious, but we can't do. Um, and that has some important consequences for international programs. One of them is that uh, for international capacity building, uh, it's almost impossible for us to, to do any project that requires matching or reduced FNA. And so if I get an RFA, the first thing I look at is does it allow full FNA and does it uh, allow uh, or does it require matching? And if it, if it doesn't allow full FNA and, and requires matching, I just say, well, sorry, probably isn't worth our time. You know, we fought that battle before. We don't, we don't want to do that. One of the consequences of that, which we've increasingly talked about, is the places where donors are willing to pay full F&A and not require matching are often conflict and post-conflict countries where they struggle to find people to do that. So there are some real issues on the way that we do business and you know, we could devote hours to that discussion. Another area are perverse incentives for faculty uh, and departments. Uh, and I'll mention just two of those. One of them is um, many department heads strongly discourage young faculty from being engaged internationally uh, with this argument that they will not get tenure. Now, from my personal perspective, I got tenure when I was in the Republic of Niger as a full-time employee on a USAID project. Uh, so I know it can be done personally. Uh, I know that you can do research that matches and exceeds the quality standards internationally. That's not an issue, but somehow department heads have gotten that idea and uh, that's, that's always uh, a discussion. Uh, a second issue uh, which shows up and maybe even more so on very successful projects is the faculty being very territorial. That our first speaker mentioned uh, this bottom-up faculty-led uh, approach, which has been a great strength of land-grant universities and universities in general, but it also makes coordination when, that co when, the, when, when the effort becomes larger than can be easily dealt with in a single investigator-type framework uh, can become uh, very complicated in many ways. So those are two issues, and we could go on with others. Well, I think we here at Cornell could sympathize with all the things, most of the things that have previously been mentioned. We probably have some unique problems here. You know, we're kind of a hybrid 
uh, entity. Uh, we could identify with a lot of the things that Philip was saying this morning about MIT, or we could identify with a lot of uh, things that happened at Purdue. I'm not sure, you know, being a part of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, I'm not sure we always, as an institution, recognize our comparative advantage in 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 the world and and uh, move uh, in a coherent way as an institution to take advantage of those comparative advantage. Of course, I think a comparative advantage is, is our ability in the plant sciences and the food sciences, Catherine, and, 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 I, and I know you do too, and you're the one who uh, fights those uh, battles, and, and we appreciate it. So I think that's something that's unique to Cornell, and since many people are here from Cornell, we, I think we should all reflect on how we address that uh, better. That's terrific. Now, I'm going to ask one more question of the panelists, and, and we'll start with Ronnie and come this way. So this last question, I asked them to be a, a little bit introspective and to look at their own institutions. The next one, um, we, we uh, won't put these in concrete, so we won't uh, hold you responsible for these necessarily, but we're going to ask you for a crystal ball. Uh, we're going to ask you uh, what current models will service as we move into unprecedented at times, that's looking ahead, and which of our land-grant models will no longer be relevant. We, we heard Dr. Lowenberg DeBoer tell us that one size does not fit all, and I believe that that is likely to be true, and that's precisely what this question is about. So, Ronnie, if you would talk to us about what you think. Well, I think, I think partnerships, and, and I'm talking about, you know, real partnerships, <laughs> partnerships where you really depend on your other partner, not, not just where you come together cosmetically to go after some money, but maybe a partnership where you hire a faculty member, you know, and give them uh, tenure in the fullness of time, and, and, and they're situated at, a, at another institution uh, for, for their career. I, I, think, I think these kinds of durable, uh, sustaining partnerships may be what we need to uh, look at, and uh, we we've just uh, had a major uh, effort with the durable rust resistance in wheat project, which involves the, uh, 20 institutions from around the world, supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and and DFID, and you know that's that's been a uh, I think uh, it may sound like we're bragging a bit, but it's been a very uh, successful effort, and and I hope here we can. We can build on that effort and continue to uh, foster those kinds of partnerships that everybody involved really, I think, really, really cherishes. All the partners feel that we've done the right thing to address this problem, and they're proud of their contribution, and, uh, you know, it's worked. So I, I hope we can replicate that. In terms of the land grant model, the way that I see it and we see it at, at Purdue is the core of the model is very solid and very relevant for the future. The idea that you put in the same organization uh, agricultural education, research, and extension has been well proven. It's not an accident that really the only two countries that I know of that have done that uh, to the full extent are the U.S. and India, and both of those are countries where, while being very different, agricultural uh, education, research and development and technology transfer has gone uh, very well. Um, but the question now is, how do we implement that? How do we work that out uh, in this newly uh, ch ever-changing changing world? And one of the challenges, I think, uh, and certainly one we have at Purdue, is how do we extend that beyond what we've traditionally known as agriculture? Uh, there's a tremendous interest by faculty at Purdue outside of agriculture, in engineering, in the sciences, in veterinary medicine, uh, in uh, food security-related issues. Uh, how do we involve them, even though their colleges don't necessarily uh, recognize those efforts to the same degree that we do in agriculture. How do we how do we manage those? Because at Purdue, 
the business structure doesn't uh, facilitate that kind of, of interaction. So I would say, yes, the core land grant model uh, is still highly relevant, uh, but uh, we need to spread it beyond what we've traditionally known as agriculture uh, to uh, a much, much broader set of disciplines. Thank you. Well, when I, when I became dean, one of the challenges had been to uh, move academics, research, and extension together. But in my negotiation, I said I had to be the dean, the research director, and the extension administrator. And for a simple reason, not because of power, but because we want to make sure that all three areas are speaking, you know, in a comprehensive and cohesive manner. And, and that, that, that's very important, so that internal partnership is very important in terms of what you do, because uh, we all believe in silos. You know, I'm a soft physicist, so I don't want to just talk about water resources management every day, you know, and forget about the family and consumer sciences. But we have to have genuine partnership within our organizations. And so, uh, as I indicated earlier in my talk, was that we continue to evolve, but we have to look at how best we can put this idea together. Because when I hear the land grant system, it is not a system by definition, but it is an idea that continues to evolve. So there are serious limitations and so forth. So if we can start looking at how best we can put that tripartite effort together, that will lead us to doing many, many good things in the international community. Well, I'd begin by just reiterating what, what Ronnie brought up. I think this notion, and what all the panelists have brought up, is this notion of uh, uh, partnership is, is critical to, to going forward. Uh, and I think I would also add my own particular take on this is building sustainable institutions of higher education is also fundamental to, to national development strategies. Every country wants a strong institution uh, of higher education, and we should be working with them to build their capacity to be exactly that. Uh, Ronnie brought up the, the whole notion uh, of some of the critiques coming from the outside, even some from the developing countries themselves about, you know, biotechnology and, and GMOs and all that. I've, I've often thought, and I know the, the panelists share this same idea, is the, what we should be doing is, and what we are doing in, in many cases, is building their capacity, these countries' capacity, to do their own research so that they can make their own decisions on this, rather than being buffeted by the, the, the Europeans or being buffeted by the United States private sector. No, no, let's build their capacity so that they can make their decisions on this. Now, one of the components of the land-grant model that I've been, when, when I've been engaged in working with other institutions, other agricultural uh, higher education institutions, a component of the, the, the land grant model that I have found most problematic in working with these countries is, the, uh, is our notion of extension. I'm not saying that extension is not important. It's just that our conception, when we conceive of it all being under one umbrella, as we all know here in this room, you know, extension in, in most other countries is in kind of what you would call a Ministry of Agriculture model. You've got extension and research in a Ministry of Agriculture. You, you, you've got a, a Ministry of Higher Education, a Ministry of Education where the universities are. And heaven forbid that any of those groups ever talk to themselves. Uh, and this, this is a real development constraint. And you know, you know, when we're working with these universities, uh, uh, agricultural universities, and we talk about extension, it's where does it fit? I've seen many an effort with these universities stop and start. You can, in fact, you can kind of look at the, their, their efforts with extension that, that, that follows some type of project intervention. The project ends, and that particular extension component also ends. So, and I do believe the answer came out, the answer to this came out of what we've already been discussing, and that's broader based partnerships. We need to broaden our partnerships beyond you know, the university beyond the ministries of agriculture 
and to work with the, the, the private sector in some cases, and also with the NGO community and, 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 and branching these things out. So I'll conclude there. Well, I'm just going to add uh, that we uh, seldom have an opportunity to, uh, you know, scratch it all and start all over again, right? Um, institutions <laughs> build on whatever has been laid already, and it's, it would be nice if you could just say, well, you know what, that didn't work, let's just throw it all away and start from scratch, now that we have knowledge uh, based on experience. Um, we have such an opportunity at Texas A&M, at, at the Borlaug Institute, um, in, in a very unusual place. And our, our first speaker this morning uh, talked about the, um, uh, the country of Qatar. And it's a country where we at Texas A&M are involved because of Education City. We're one of the campuses that are there uh, for engineering, not agriculture. But why it's a perfect uh, experiment is because it, that's a country that is very, very wealthy, as, as we all can appreciate, um, but it's a country that does not produce most of its food for very obvious reasons. They have lots and lots of money, but they buy all of their food. But they have realized, even they have realized that, you know, you can't do that and uh, expect that you're going to be uh, self-sufficient in the sense that if something happens with your suppliers of, of food, there, there goes your, your whole institution. So um, we're working with them to, to develop a system, uh, including extension, including uh, uh, a system where they can uh, reliably uh, start producing not all of their food. I don't think they'll ever get there, but, but do it and use technology to accomplish that. And so they've had nothing, to be honest with you, very, very little bit of a, in terms of a structure to, to accomplish all of this. They have the money to, to start from scratch, if you will. And so we're going to try to help them to do that. And it'll be interesting for me, not only because of helping them, uh, but also we'll be able to try maybe some crazy ideas. Um, and uh, because the money is no object in that situation. And, and maybe we'll get to developing a, a good model that maybe can be, can be applied in various uh, circumstances. I agree completely that one size does not fit all uh, by any means. But, but it'll be an interesting thing to do. And I will say to all of you that I completely agree that partnerships is the way to go. We've always said that the constraint to partnerships is not a lack of willingness. We all like each other and have lots of things in common as, as professionals. It's not that. It's that back home at our home institutions, you know, uh, they expect you to bring home the bacon, if you will. And if you have to slice that bacon into many pieces, uh, it's, it's not very supported by, by the, the administration. So, and, and very understandably so. I don't mean to criticize administrations. They, they have their own problems and their own uh, pressures that they have to, to work under. But that is the reality of it. So if we, if we found a way uh, in which we can maximize our strengths, uh, complementary strengths uh, with each other, and do so in such a way that we go after sources of, of funding that are not the traditional. It's not USDA or USAID, but bigger sources of funding, um, World Bank and in huge foundations, institutions that can really afford, countries like Qatar, that can really afford to put in some serious money uh, to solve some serious problems on a long-term basis. I think that's the model that's going to ultimately work. Thank you very much to the panel. And now I'd like to open this uh, session to, uh, to all of you uh, who are here. Uh, I'd like you to please come to the microphone so that we can capture uh, your voices clearly on the web stream and, and so forth. And, and please give your name uh, and your institution as you're asking the questions. So floor is now open for any questions that you may have or comments. and I'm in international programs. You know, I think the first speaker made some comments about uh, Chemonics and uh, some of these big consulting companies. 
And we've had a couple of seminars here from DAI in particular. And there was a question asked, how much is your total funding, which you get every year? And the answer was about $350 million. And how much of that portfolio is in agriculture? And they say a majority. Mm -hmm. Then a question was asked, how much of the interaction do you have with US land grants? And they say, well, you know, it's very difficult for us to collaborate with US land grants. And you know, they explained a lot of issues. So then we said, well, we have a lot of young students and faculty who are interested. They say, well, then they say, well, you know, it's difficult. And uh, they don't want to expand more. But then you go to Kimanex, you know, and they're making, what, 500 million? 600 million. 600 million. So I'm just wondering where is the disconnect here, and how could we be as a US land grant system, you know, capitalizing and working with some of these big institutions? And then you have foundations. You just mentioned about Land O'Lakes or Heifer International. I mean, you can, and they're all on their own, but you talk to them about how much interaction do they have. They say, again, it's difficult. So they go to, you know, consultants or retired people, stuff like that. So maybe I thought you could comment on how a U.S. land grant could be working together with some of these big fish. Mm -hmm. Well, if I can just begin and then uh, pass it on to my colleagues here. Excellent points you've made, and, and those are great questions. And all of us, I think, here at, at this table and, and various of you have worked with some of these for-profit companies as well as uh, non-profit, uh, non-government organizations. And, and those large ones, they don't necessarily have the science to do the work, so they will subcontract with all of us, right? And, and, uh, but the majority of the funds are kept uh, centrally with them, and, and we, we become one of many partners, and, and we get a little bit of money, but not necessarily as much. There's a huge amount of money out there. Obviously, they're getting uh, the, the lion's share. And they continually talk about how it's difficult to work with us. And I, I am like you. I, I don't quite understand what is so difficult uh, because we in land-grant universities, I believe, have become very professional at working internationally um, through our pro institutes, programs, centers, et cetera. We have become very professional at it. It's not like uh, they're going to some university that's never worked overseas and doesn't know what it takes to set up a, a project in another country. We all have you know, lots of experience in doing so. So, so I, I, I never quite understand uh, where, the, where the rub is. We have at Texas A&M at the Borlaug Institute uh, partnered uh, now very recently with Heifer International. The problem with some of these in entities like that is that they also need money. They get money from their donors, but it's not enough, so they also go after uh, other f sources of funding, um, and they're seeing the wisdom in partnering with institutions like ours because we have the the, the researchers, the students, uh, the extension specialists that they really don't necessarily have. So, so perhaps what we do is we we uh, form you know s consortia of of a combination of these smaller nonprofits with the land grant institutions. And, and be able to then maybe better compete with, with the larger for-profit firms that, that really get the lion's share of the funds. Two, two points, I think. One, one of the issues is that in many cases, and this particularly occurs with the large consulting firms, is they're implementing projects that um, we as universities may not be very good at, at doing. That, they, they're doing what I would say is routine development work. They're taking known principles, things that uh, everyone knows works, and going out there and implementing those. And universities are not very good at that. That's, that's not our business. Our, our business is much more on the cutting edge. If you have a really difficult problem, you need innovation, that's where donors uh, can legitimately, I think, go to a university. So we first need to think about, okay, are they asking us to do things or should we be involved in the things they're doing? 
The second one is, uh, and this is maybe more aimed at the, the large NGOs, they have their own institutional culture, just like we have our institutional culture. And it takes a while and it takes years and effort to get to know uh, e each institutional culture. And sometimes there are structural barriers so that make that impossible. And I'll give you two examples. One of them, we've had uh, a very good partnership with Catholic Relief Services in, in Africa, particularly on our grain storage work. We know a lot of the country representatives. Uh, the current uh, CEO of Catholic Relief Services was on Purdue faculty some years ago. We know her well. So there's been a lot of connections and we're starting to understand that culture. There's another uh, NGO that we've worked with a lot, uh, World Vision, but we have great difficulty with because of its federated structure that uh, we have to go through World Vision US in order to work with their office in Malawi or Niger or wherever it is. But uh, the US office can't make promises or commitments for that country office because of their federated structure. So there are real structural issues in certain of those. And so overall, it's just getting to know each other, finding out, OK, are there some that uh, it's just really difficult for structural reasons to work with? Are there others where if we know what each other's quirks are, uh, we can do a better job of working together. Thank you. I, I'd just add on and, and just say, you know, getting to the structural issues is I think the, the, it's actually a cultural issue. I think the, the, the current, if we, you know, uh, the, the current USAID emphasis is on relatively short term uh, rapid impacts. And I think our university culture, and I think capacity, institutional capacity building, uh, it's long term. It's not quick. I think actually development itself is long term. And sometimes we expect miracles, you know. I, I've seen, you know, RFPs come out and, where they talk about rapid impacts in one year. Give me a break. <laughs> you know, I just, uh, you know, I, and, and I, I'm looking at these going, goodness, who's kidding who here? But. You know, I, so I, I think it's a cultural issue is that culturally, well, I think we, you know, uh, you know, we evolved in the 90s uh, uh, away from the, 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 the AID culture, and that became much more short-term or impact-oriented than we are. And I think these, the, the consulting firms uh, play into that. They, they deliver on that. I also think there's some areas where they might be more effective than us, and that one of these areas might be in tech transfer. But I don't believe they're very good at building sustainable institutions and capacity building. I don't think they do that very well at all. Well, I just want to take a stab at this. Uh, as, as, as the only person here from an 1890 institution on the panel, Texas has a public, I'll turn to write that down. Uh, Texas has a population of 26,059,203. Um, <laughs> Today. Yes, that's, well, I think it's even more now. Okay. And we have 54, last yeah, yeah, the last 15 minutes. Because in, in Houston, where we live, they come, I think, about 200 a day, you know, and so forth. But it, this is important because, uh, 54, 254 counties, uh, Preview A&M is situated in 36, uh, but we are mandated by federal statute to cater to the need of limited resource citizens, that 8.4 million citizens that we cater to. Now, the partnership that will lead us to some of these things, these 8.4 million throughout the 18, uh, 90 institutions, and there are some maybe some a million and so forth in other states. We have been there and have experienced how you work with some of those from developing countries. Because when you go to these limited resource individuals, how you deal with them, their trust and so forth is one of the key things. And sometimes it's difficult when you have somebody with money think that they know the culture of the individual not understanding the social economic issues. But we are Prairie View, what is Tuskegee Institute or Tuskegee University, what is Alabama A&M University, or Alcorn State, 
or Prairie View A&M University, we have worked with those type of individuals because they're a limited resource. Now, teaming with the other land-grant universities is very important so that we can drive that engine because the MIT, they can do what all they want to do, but imagine where they've gone to. But I don't think that many that have gone to some of those difficult places to deal with those individuals that are there. So we all chase the money, but we want to look at sustainability. And so we need to start, I'm sorry, Cornell, you know, you got way north, so you don't have an 89 institution. But that doesn't mean that Ohio State is not teaming with Tuskegee you know, University in a lot of things that they do. Because you have the two experiences coming together and trying to guide these individuals and how to carry on development internationally. Just quickly, I would say the problem uh, on both sides is incentive. If you talk about the big consulting firms, uh, they charge over 100% in direct cost and they want to employ all the people on the ground directly and charge indirect cost on that uh, salary, so they don't want to give a subcontract to a university where they get uh, uh, IDC on the first 25000 So there's zero incentive on their side. On our side, what they, what they would like to do is cherry pick our faculty as consultants, and on our side there is actually an incentive. You, each faculty member gets 22 days of consulting time, and they like to make the best of it. Uh, so, uh, you know, that happens. So we've got an incentive situation that just pretty much precludes true uh, collaboration with those large firms. So my name is Kim Machu from Cornell Corporate Extension in New York City. Uh, so I'm very junior to all of you, all the panelists, with land-grant corporate extension, land-grant system, um, <clears throat> so eight and a half years. But my experience with international agriculture in 25 years and with nine years land-grant systems. So I heard something about food security and nutrition, so part of my profession as a nutritionist. So it was really in developing countries, not only that, in some developed countries in, in, in Europe, so Switzerland and Germany and Netherlands, when I took land grant system here, so I gave a seminar at the universities and lectures. So they really appreciate <clears throat> one of the integration between agriculture and nutrition. So that is really uh, complement each other in terms of any innovative or development programs to achieve really success in each sectors. So when I was in uh, Africa, in, uh, in, in Asia, so including my home country is Burma, so that's, you are right. So in terms of the Ministry of Agriculture, totally different from Ministry of Health. So when we talk about nutrition and food security, Ministry of Agriculture, so they don't fully understand and they don't accept our systems, our strategies and approach through US so USA programs or what about World Bank. And when we talk nutrition and councils and nutrition and ministers, so then they have also, they don't fully understand about agricultural programs. So when we bring really great what we do here in the States, and uh, you know, in New York City, we're working people all over the world in New York City. I'm working with 38,000 people every year. So, so then I took this message to them, how can we integrate as a nutritionist, as an ex scientist? in these two sectors. How do we help each other? How do we accomplish each other? It's really great. So some of the, so many of them, they're trying to understand what we use in the land grant system in the States, how we did success stories in those areas, both agricultural sectors and nutrition sectors. How can we help our hunger people and food security issues? So that's the only one my comments. Thank you. Well, just to comment on that, breaking out of our silos is very important. And so many times, you know, when that, the RF, uh, RFP comes out, you know, you, you, you can think about merging agriculture and nutrition or public health and agriculture and things like this. But the RFA doesn't call for that. So there's, there's some of that thinking, and, and we've discussed that, you know, when the RFAs come out, it's kind of a top-down process, and we have to respond to that. I know uh, I worked with my counterpart here from uh, University of Wisconsin, where we tried to blend public health and agriculture together. And I think it was, uh, well, well, it was eventually 
rejected at a certain stage in Washington, D.C. They didn't quite get our innovation there. They didn't see it, John. <laughs> well, uh, one of the things that I've, I've done uh, uh, in my role as a station administrator and research director is that in, in the counties that we work with citizens, uh, first of all, I tell folks that the College of Agriculture and Human Sciences, when I'm talking to the College of Ag, and then the family and consumer sciences folks say, Dr. Johnson, uh, what about human sciences? I said, well, the Department of Agriculture doesn't say Department of Agriculture, Rural Development, and on and on and on. I'm talking about U.S. Department of Agriculture. It's agriculture just for brevity. But the deal is that we have what I call an indi individualized client plan, which is that when I'm talking about a client, I'm talking about our farm family. I'm talking about that individual because when my program leader tells me at the end of the month, or well, the beginning of the month, every Tuesday, when they're reporting and telling me that we've engaged uh, 30,000 youth, it's fine. But how did Family and Consumer Sciences, Ag and Natural Resources, uh, Community and Economic Development, and the uh, 4-H, how did they work together? Because you can help that farmer today to grow all the beans, but he will have to save his money, okay? So community economic development comes in. Uh, the next thing is that let's say they have two kids or let's say they have a kid. I want 4-H and youth development to help that young person to be a good person in the community. And of course, family and consumer science person will have to help that mother so that they can have nutritious food. So it is an approach that we're using at our Prairie View A&M University in dealing with people. So what you're saying is right. It is not just because when we are talking about, and I'll be short on this, when we are talking about a community because we team with the, the county judges and so forth, and well, you know, we don't know what extension is doing so much in the counties. I say, well, if you want development to come into your county, you should look at what 4 h and youth development has done and reduce child delinquency and so forth. Look at prison population. You are saving money. People can come in, you know, and build into your community because you have low crime rate and so forth. So how we express ourselves from that crop to the table is very important in selling, in selling the message or telling the message to the people. Well, we, we are just about out of time, but one last question, and, and we'll move quickly on this one. Thank you. Uh, my name is Hussein al nashar I'm an independent consultant out of Oregon. Uh, however, I'm very close to the other OSU, uh, Oregon State University. Uh, I, <laughs> yeah, Oklahoma as well. <laughs> the Oregon State. The <laughs> We don't have that problem yet. However, uh, Ed Ray, the president, is actually with the former president of Ohio State. <laughs> Provost, yeah. uh, anyhow, uh, I was just interested. We, we heard a lot of great presentations and, and interesting comment. And, and uh, I was just wondering if we need the land-grant university to return to the interdisciplinary degrees, uh, increasing partnership across discipline. Uh, it's great to communicate with agriculture and nutrition department, uh, but have we managed to cross the barrier between agriculture and engineering, computer science, technology, and so on and so forth? Uh, uh, there is, I think, a great need, and, and the panel should really uh, bring that to administrations. We're really in a dire need of return to the interdisciplinary degrees. It will create a different communication level, it, def it will def just generate ample opportunities for crossing rather than competing for granting and for resources. That's just my comment. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, and at this point, I would uh, please join me in thanking our panel for a wonderful presentation this morning. We are about to take a coffee break. 10, 15 minutes? Okay, 15, and we'll reconvene here at 11.30. Can you get back to...